Well, Wednesday night, Bishop Tobin said no to marijuana. Well, we have another member of the clergy that says, <clears throat> yes. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Yeah, I was actually interestingly surprised at Bishop Tobin's advocacy on legalization of marijuana. Uh, I, I will tell you that I am so interestedly ambivalent about this. And of course, that is oxymoronic. It doesn't make any sense. But I'm very interested in the subject matter, and I can't get off the dime one way or the other. So uh, the more voices we hear on this, the better. I don't think that we're going to see legislation here in this session in the Rhode Island State House uh, on uh, a legalization bill. Funnier things have happened, but uh, it's coming. If it's not coming this session, it's coming next session. So we've got a guest from out of town who uh, has written to the bishop about the bishop's point of view on this, and he's a member of the clergy, and uh, he is not Al Sharpton, he is Al Sharp, and you'll meet him coming up in a moment. But first, I just wanted to make a mention about last night's program. For those of you that are nightly viewers, and I appreciate that so much, and it seems like so many of you are with the numbers that we're looking at these days, so thank you. Um, a little disappointed about last night's program, and uh, don't tell anybody, but on Fridays we actually record the Friday program on Thursday afternoon after the Thursday production. So I don't have a lot of time to replay. We don't have a lot of resources to replay some of what went on for the show that you saw last night. We had Bill Walaska, the state senator, on here, and he was talking about his bill, which I uh, you know, certainly support, which expands from cancer to other diseases uh, a mandate that health insurance cover experimental drugs. Uh, we talked about the legislative process, and he asserted in headlines kind of led to the idea that the House had already passed his bill. The House has not passed his bill. The House has passed another bill. They don't match up, and they got to be worked out with deliberations. And that's important. You know, facts matter. And uh, Bill has been through a hell of a situation battling leukemia. I'm going to give him a pass. Uh, his staff, not so much. You know, that, uh, you know, it's important to, to, to provide the right information. It's on me to get the information correct. but. It's on me to be able to say to you, we didn't quite get it right yesterday, but we will uh, going forward. All right. Having said that, I think the intent in both houses is to provide the right kind of uh, legislation to expand the experimental drug approvals for people who have diseases and um, prognosis other than cancer involved. All righty. Um, that's that. Let's get to this conversation about legalizing marijuana. Uh, first headline. So the projection is out of the journal. This headline caused us to invite Bishop Tobin in on Wednesday night, two nights ago. And here's part of what he had to say about it. And my perspective was, what do we have to gain from making this legal? Now, you know, I'm certainly not opposed to uh, the use of marijuana for medical purposes. I think that's legitimate. I'm not even opposed to the decriminalization of marijuana. I think that speaks to the uh, law enforcement and the incarceration and so forth that some people have expressed their concerns about. But to make it legal, to say that there's nothing in our societal norms that prevents people from using this, I just don't know what that adds to the equation. And I, I think it has the potential of doing more, more harm than good. Rhode Island had on and say, here comes this out-of-towner from the clergy to uh, to write the bishop in an open letter suggesting that he's not thinking very well about this. And here's an excerpt from that letter. Um, you got to have a big screen to see this. But uh, more importantly, in continuing to focus on marijuana legislation, you're distracting attention and resources from what we both fear most, the dangers of addiction. We share the common purpose of reducing the harm of drugs in our society, but we differ on the means. Your commentary is clear and engaging, clever, I'm sorry, and engaging, but ultimately, ultimately it's outdated and wrong. All right, come on in, Reverend Al Sharp. It is a pleasure to have you on board. Welcome, Good to be here. Welcome to Rhode Island. You are here uh, doing a little work this week, lobbying, I guess, the legislature. Uh, reaching forming. out to clergy, expressing our point of view, uh, working with the excellent staff of the Marijuana Policy Project who've been uh, laboring long and hard to bring this issue uh, forward in the Rhode Island legislature. Before we uh, we get to the arguments, a little background on you, the organizations you operate for and work for and advocate for, and your history as a, as a member of the clergy. 
Uh, I was uh, ordained uh, in uh, 2007, went to divinity school late in life uh, when I was 52 years old. I've been doing faith-based advocacy work uh, for all that period of time and the, the uh, more that I worked in the area of uh, drug policy and mass incarceration, the more I realized there were so many people in prison that shouldn't be there uh, at all because of low-level drug offenses. That took me to pushing back the war on drugs and mobilizing clergy nationally. The organization is called Clergy for a New Drug Policy. Most fundamentally, it's not only about drug laws, it's about changing the culture of punishment in this country. Uh, and that's the underlying theme of all that, all that we do. Now, obviously, the drug laws are a reflection of that culture of punishment, but uh, the whole notion of diversion, keeping people out of the criminal justice system, ending civil asset forfeiture laws are all important. Uh, interesting. Uh, Jess, can you show me, after, after that uh, screen uh, shuts down, can you show me the commentary from uh, Andy Horowitz that uh, occurred on our program uh, a handful of weeks ago. What, what I see, I've been a practicing criminal defense lawyer for 30 years. What I've seen is the war on drugs and in particular the war on marijuana having a devastating impact on low-income communities and most particularly communities of color. Um, our enforcement of the marijuana laws, all of our drug laws, is extraordinarily discriminatory. A legal mind that I respect, he's a good man, he works down mm -hmm. at Roger Williams University. I asked for that based on your going yes. in that direction. Absolutely. You are on the same... Absolutely. Plate. We were at a forum at Brown Medical School in which uh, he spoke and uh, uh, he made that point, and he's absolutely right. When I find clergy most responsive, uh, it's often because of simply the social justice issues that the drug laws are uh, uh, brought to bear against uh, lower income, mostly people of color, and it's highly discriminatory. Well, it's interesting that, that you bring that up. Um, with Bishop Tobin on Wednesday, I, I, I challenged him in, in, in asking about social justice because the Catholic Church and the diocese has been, you know, historically pretty Active, have a wonderful local. social justice uh, right. policy. Uh, he suggests, as you saw in that, that piece of video that we just saw a couple of minutes ago, that he's okay with decriminalization. Yeah. He's okay with medical use, but he's got this qualm about you know opening up stores on the corners. Yeah. Uh, what's wrong with that? Let me answer that in two parts. The first part is that he probably wasn't for medical marijuana several years ago, and he, wa and he wasn't for decriminalization several years ago because it's taken a pushing back against the war on drugs uh, to make those changes, and this is uh, simply an well, extension of that. that's an you can make. I can't make okay. it. I've never talked to him about of course. it, but, but you're, you're, you're but suggesting But I know historically that's experience. true. I've seen the progression of people that were against all changes uh, move towards decriminalization, and now we are indeed talking about uh, legalization, and I think the uh, he says uh, what what good can be accomplished. Let's start first with the notion that clergy are not going out and saying everybody ought to smoke pot. What we are saying is that uh, by legalizing, what we are doing is regulating. We're taxing and regulating, which means that we're taking people away from the illicit market. Uh, we are making sure that if, uh, uh, when uh, marijuana is available, that people know what they're buying. You know, people in alleyways don't ask for ID cards from kids. So I think ultimately we can argue that uh, people are going to be safer. And also kids are going to be understanding that we're honest as adults uh, about what it is that uh, uh, drug use actually is. Uh, they know that alcohol is far more dangerous, and I would challenge the bishop to ask whether he drinks alcohol or not. We know that alcohol is far more dangerous than marijuana. Kids know that, and then when we say no marijuana, uh, but alcohol is fine, they see us as, frankly, hypocrites and not talking straight to them. So uh, it's safer if we, if we distinguish between uh, uh, an illicit market and regulating uh, on a market that we understand much better. Uh, kids, kids will understand that. We will be able to draw a distinction between uh, the fact that kids should not use marijuana until they reach a certain age, uh, and it, it's uh, certainly okay if for recreational use after they reach a certain age. We can't even make that distinction now because we kind of pretend that it's not really happening, that they're not getting marijuana, and we're not and we're not realizing that what they do get is unsafe. All right, uh, thorough answer. We'll uh, we'll pick at that a little bit when we come back. Stay with us. Do we really need that? What's the point of it? What's the purpose of it? And especially now when we have such a huge problem with uh, opioid uh, abuse and 
the, the drug use that uh, seeps into the community, especially the minority community in some places, um, do we take away the last societal barrier that says this is not a good thing to do, it's something we should not be encouraging? Bishop Tobin, on, on, on Wednesday evening, on the issue of legalizing marijuana, uh, Reverend Al Sharp is an activist uh, arguing the other point. You work for organizations that are looking to do what, fill in the blank, you characterize. Well, certainly in any way pushing back the failed war on drugs, anything that works towards health, not punishment in response to drug policy about marijuana, uh, passing medical marijuana where that hasn't yet been passed, decriminalizing and really decriminalizing all drugs and certainly legalizing marijuana. Well, we'll get to the all drug situation in a second. So you wrote an open letter to uh, Bishop Tobin and you start by saying on May 10th you asserted in a public commentary that all drug use is sinful and immoral. I don't, uh, I don't get that sense from the bishop. In fact, he talked about uh, last night he, uh, or Wednesday night, he talked about not, re not being ready to come down on any kind of moral position on the use of marijuana. Clearly, Catholicism, I'm a practicing Catholic, is culturally ingrained uh, in alcohol. I'm not suggesting it's a booze <laughs> operation, but look, you know, most of the fundraisers are, are you know, there's a, there's a beer involved or, or a, a wine, and of course the sacrament is, is, is offered with, um, with an alcohol, small alcohol in the wine. Uh, so the church has never run away from alcohol, yeah. and I think he, he knows that he's got to be consistent there. So I, I'm not sure that you I'm not sure that you've been fair with him on that point. Well, I first of all, let's let's look closely at the notion that alcohol is far more dangerous than marijuana. So I think one does have to come to terms with that difference and say uh, why alcohol and not marijuana. Yeah, but ha but having said you that, know what? Not not yeah. having all the data in front of you, yeah. I'll stipulate to that. Okay, no, so I'll stipulate. But well, know, there have been no overdoses through uh, uh, death by overdose in marijuana. Uh, alcohol, alcoholism, alcoholism is one of the large killers in the society. Well, the moral so issue, that's not ambivalent. As, a, as a clergyman, though, I, I'm sure that you can speak to the issue of morality since you brought it up in your letter. Um, there's there could be a benign or or uh, you know nonchalant use of either alcohol or marijuana, and most uh, theologians or moralists would see the difference between use and abuse. Yes. And I think the bishop does, and that's my point. Well, I, I, the, the second part of my answer, and, and I, I'm simply taking his commentary at face value, I'd like to meet the bishop, I haven't. But he, in fact, conflates the two. He goes very fast into quoting the pope, whom I have great respect for, uh, on saying that all drug use is, is sinful. So he kind of says, we may have a little problem here with inconsistency, but let me quote the pope that says all drug use is evil. So that's what he said. He may feel differently, and he was on your show. And you, know, know, I, I, you, know, you bring that up. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with, the, with what Pope Francis is said about that. By the way, at the end of the program, we're going to reflect on the bishop's commentary on Pope Francis in general, which has caused some pause uh, in the Catholic community. Uh, stay tuned for that. What has the pope said? Uh, what he said in his commentary, that all drug use is it, immoral, I illegal is, is drug sinful. Use. He talks about addiction, but he then says all drug use. And then he says, we tried to legislate the difference. The Advil really that I take it. from my sore back right now is... I think you're making a very good point. And I frankly think the, the pope, were he he's a man of great compassion, great humanity, great decency. So I think if, if he were here and you were asking him these questions, he would say what you're saying, but that's not what the bishop quoted. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I mean very little. But right. could, could I, sure. Go, go your way. I, 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 I actually go where you're going with your question. I said where the bishop and I really differ is how you respond when serious abuse is what is happening. Yeah. Uh, and the war on drugs, which I think he is uh, at least implicitly supporting in his position on marijuana, uh, talks about punishment. Uh, not uh, compassion and mercy. And to me, the gospel, and I should think the bishop and I would agree on this, uh, agree that the gospel calls us to mercy and compassion and forgiveness and healing. And the war on drugs doesn't talk about any of that. The war on drugs is a, is a violent war which calls people criminals who use drugs. That's what they do. And this is part of changing that and bringing the notion, and we're the uh, dawn of a new era in this country in response to drug use, bringing us to the notion of harm reduction, saying that it's not only about absence. You take people where they are and you try to meet them and help them overcome their addiction. It's a fascinating conversation, this war on drugs, and your, and your take and your definition on it. You know, a long time ago I remember saying, I don't understand the war on drugs and the way we're playing it. Why are we, why are we 
why are we punishing the marketplace? Why aren't we punishing the producer? And I don't think we do enough of that. And frankly, the politics of the war on drugs and the international diplomacy that exists back and forth is, is a very intricate, high level, and perhaps not easy to follow scenario. Yes, it's right? very complex. It's very complex. Yeah, exactly. So on the war on drugs, are you saying change the battlefield or end it completely? I think you've got to go after traffickers. Uh, I'm, I'm making a distinction between use and trafficking. Nobody is saying uh, in pushing back against the war on drugs that people that sell drugs illegally uh, shouldn't be punished for breaking the law. But the question is, how do you distribute drugs? Who is distributing them? And under a regulated system, when something is legal, uh, kids are safer, uh, you're more honest about what you're doing, and you can then go after people who continue to be in the illicit market. But nobody is saying you let up on traffickers, but you're creating a sane system so you know what is being sold uh, and uh, then go after people who violate that system. Do, do, you, do you think that this legalization process is going to put traffickers out of business or severely dent their opportunities? I don't think we know. It's certainly going to reduce the illicit trafficking. Why would uh, folks in other countries be so concerned about the changes that we're making uh, if, if they felt that it wasn't going to reduce their business uh, and, and their profits? Uh, uh, there are folks, I'm sure, that are very nervous in Mexico about the possibility that someday we might legalize marijuana in this, this country. Uh, so I think there, there, it will have some impact. I don't know enough, and I'm not sure anybody does, to say it will drive the, the illicit market totally out of business. I, don't, I think that's unrealistic. But it will make a difference, and a difference matters. What do you think we are learning um, from the states that have gone to legalization? You know, a, a couple of months ago, I would have said it's too early to tell, because uh, you don't want to just cherry pick, as uh, indeed often people who uh, are on the other side, and I try not to be uh, there come up with examples that show that things are so much worse. But I think we know a lot more now, even in the last couple of months. And in fact, even in the last week, Governor Hickenlooper in Colorado, who was an opponent of this, said, you know, I may not have been right. I mean, probably wasn't negative about himself, but he did say, you know, this may be working out better than I thought it would. Uh, we, traffic fatalities are not what they were worried about. There are very good signs coming out of Colorado. And one generalization, I'm sorry I'm talking too much here, but the mm -hmm. fact is in all the instances where we've had reform that I know about, the fear was that the sky would fall. And you know what? The sky hasn't been falling. All right, we'll come back. Any, in any of these reforms. Some final thoughts from the Reverend when we come back on this. And those comments that the bishop made a couple of nights ago, still to come. I feel very comfortable with delivering the message of, I, you know, this is your guys' decision of where you want to go from here. But it helps us all if we start to make better decisions on how we do it. And, and the more we create a coalition of thinking through the next three steps, uh, I think the better off we're all going to be. Andrew Friedman, who is the coordinator in Colorado for the marijuana program there, who visited here recently uh, to talk to the legislature and others about what he knew. He didn't advocate one way or the other. He was just kind of uh, in an informing role. And uh, you're suggesting that some of the data and the results in the last couple of months there have tempered the opposition there. Uh, what do you say, uh, Reverend, to people like me who cannot get off the dime on this? I am not by nature an ambivalent person. I, I opine for a living. It's a, it would be a, uh, a threat to my livelihood if I was you know, straddling the fence on all too many issues. Uh, I, I see both arguments pretty clearly, I think. And if I had to flip a coin, that's what I would end up doing, mm -hmm. flipping a coin. I would say that you, as indeed our whole society is, is a product of truly an, an almost an, uncult, an unconscious culture of punishment in this country. We are willing to punish much too easily and liberally and create another class based on simply the very fact of drug use. Well, you got me on that one because that's the argument that lean, makes me lean your way, which is I, I'm just sick and tired of too many people in jail. Yeah. And, I, and I see the social injustice that comes along with that. And I see... I see you know, certain classes of people be able to, to, to advocate uh, via the system and, and get out of it, and yep. I see others that are, that are doing too much time. At the same time, it just feels like another uh, signature approval on sedation in this society of ours is 
you know, I need people. You know, I, I, we got to be, we got to be a little bit more. Yeah, I, I think you were speaking for parents, for example, that are worried about what might happen. I know, I'm, no, I'm talking about the idiot voters out there who don't have a clue. <laughs> okay. Those, yeah. the, you know, listen, I got a 21 year old. She and I have had the conversations before, and I'll trust her now. I've okay. done my job, and I hope yeah. she'll do well, uh, make good decisions. But I'm talking about an overall <laughs> mentality me, in our country. Let me give right you now. a parallel which says education, informed education, some of which would be funded by this bill, is what really gets at, what really responds to what you're talking about. Teen smoking has increased by 50% in the last 20 years. Marijuana. No, teen smoking oh, of tobacco. cigarettes. No, by smoking I meant cigarettes. Hmm. Now that is legal that, that's and that's declined. Marijuana is illegal and it's staying about constant. So why is that? Oh, sorry, so tobacco smoking has decreased. Tobacco smoking, right, 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 sorry, right, right, not right, just right. smoking. Tobacco smoking, right. cigarettes has decreased in teen right. smoking. Because they know how bad it is for them. Exactly, and how has that happened? I think it started with Everett Koop back in the 60s who said, you know, we can change public attitudes. We used to have surgeon generals in this country that just kind of hung around and did what they were going to do. Everett Koop came along and said public campaigns can inform people about their health. And for the last 40 or 50 years, we've been doing that. In the last 20 years, especially with cigarettes, we, uh, we have, in effect, regulated them by saying where they can be sold, what the price is. The same thing will happen with marijuana, and it will affect attitudes there. And I would expect use will actually go down when it's regulated. All right. Uh, I don't know that this legislation is going to make it this session, but eventually Rhode Island is going to have to Smoke it or not, you know, <laughs> you know, blank or get off the yep. pot. You got any more cliches for me? Uh, pleasure to have met you. Uh, please come back. Good and, to meet you. And, and uh, maybe I can get you and the bishop together one I'd day. I'd love to do that. I bet you, I bet you would. <laughs> uh, thanks, Reverend. We come back. Speaking of, bishop said some interesting things I just want to kind of revisit at the end of the week. Stay with us. So uh, I think Catholics are having a conversation about what our bishop here in the Diocese of Providence said about uh, Pope Francis yesterday, or actually Wednesday. Follow this. One of the things we've had to, to learn about this pope is how to interpret him. You know, in the past, popes typically spoke very, in very structured ways with pastoral letters or homilies or decrees. This pope is taken to very informal, off-the-cuff, off uh, impromptu conversations and so often someone has to go back and say this is what the Pope said or this is what he meant or this is what he didn't mean. We've seen that a number of times now and that's exactly what happened with this. There was a lot of speculation about the Pope uh, ordaining women deacons but the spokesman came out the next day and said no that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about studying it so we understand it better. Uh, that's the key to interpreting this Pope I think. He has a lot of informal conversations which are fun to listen to and speculate about, but in the end, he's really not changing very much. Yeah, it led, led me to, to ask this question. It's tough for a Catholic to ask this question, but I did. Because it's been a challenge for all of us. Um, we love Pope Francis, and we all admire what he's doing for the church and the world, but it's a new style for us that I think is uh, opening up uh, a lot of conversations. My bad, I thought my question was in there. The question I asked is, does the Pope drive you crazy? Uh, drive you a little nuts, actually, is the question. And uh, the bishop uh, artfully handled that. But the smile on his face indicates that uh, this brand new leadership in the church is a challenge for all. And our somewhat conservative bishop, uh, I think, probably prays a lot every day trying to uh, accommodate the new leadership. It's fascinating, it really is. Thankfully, the bishop is open about it. And we have good dialogue, and I credit him for that. You have a great week. Reminder, we're now three to six weekdays on WPRO on the radio side. We'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. Bye.